record. Um, okay, so uh, good morning. Um, we're going to be continuing on um, in this session with some further discussion of uh, one aspect of adjunction. So we had spoken, introduced the, uh, the notion of adjunction um, as a topic interesting in its own right for diverse reasons, but also as one that, um, th that helps illustrate many uh, basic constructs within category theory in a way that's at once um, interesting and uh, often quite insightful. Uh, now, I used the, the analogy of a watering hole there that you, you get to see all sorts of interesting beasts come to the watering hole uh, if one really understands adjunctions well. And to that end, we've been sort of going on a, a tour of different applications of adjunctions. And the first uh, application, which, which uh, we examined uh, with any uh, substance, uh, was that uh, associated with um, uh, the, the use of uh, pre-orders and, and specifically Galois connections. Um, which, uh, which essentially are adjunctions between uh, pre-order categories. Um, and uh, we saw there that um, there were uh, a set of, of, of applications within computer science of this, but it also helped illustrate um, some of the principles associated with adjunctions for the particular case of pre-orders. Um, here we've uh, we've gone on to a different application of, of adjunctions, one that um, involves uh, free and forgetful functors, and the most um, accessible uh, uh, element of this is one associated with um, uh, monoids, and particularly the uh, the adjunction between sets on the one hand. Uh, and free monoids on the other. And uh, I tried to walk through that last time, but I, I had the sense that I was um, uh, somewhat falling flat in terms of, of some elements of the situation and, and ran out of time to do it full, full justice. Um, so I wanted to, to recap just a bit, but, but expand on this notion of, of free monoids and, and tie them into some computer science concepts uh, associated with lists or sequences, um, because uh, there's a very close relationship between the two. Um, I further wanted to um, talk a little bit about the issue of monoidal categories, um, which end up illustrating not only uh, an important type of functor, bifunctors, um, but they also uh, end up being really important within uh, two spheres of application. Um, one uh, associated with modeling. Uh, so it turns out that modest as they look, these uh, monoidal categories, and particularly their elaboration as symmetric monoidal categories, um, end up playing this oversized role in terms of reasoning about um, about systems through diagrams, uh, particularly the use of what are called wiring diagrams. Um, and, and they can be mapped very directly into operations on symmetric, uh, symmetric uh, monoidal categories. Um, and we're going to see some applications of that down the road. And I, I want to get a, a glimpse of that in. Um, but there's another sphere of application as well. And that is uh, that monoidal categories uh, are a stepping stone to understand monoidal functors. And monoidal functors end up playing uh, a, a sort of star role in the context of uh, what are known as applicatives, uh, which stand somewhere in between, on the one hand, um, functors, and on the other hand, uh, uh, monads. Uh, so we're going to uh, we're going to take a look at monoidal categories because they provide us uh, a way of understanding these uh, these monoidal functors, uh, these functors that preserve the monoidal structure of categories when mapping from one category to another. They they preserve that monoidal operation. They honor it. 
um, translate from a, a monoidal product in one category to the monoidal product in the other category. Um, and uh, we're going to be revisiting applicatives um, soon enough uh, in, conject in conjunction with our, our next application of adjunctions, which is going to be in the monads area. So um, while well, next week uh, we had to defer because of this uh, model code review, uh, we're going to be looking at this issue of uh, the relationship between adjunctions and monads, um, which is just incredibly rich. Um, it's hard to talk about one without talking about the other. Um, every adjunction gives rise not only to a monad, but to a corresponding co-monad. And indeed, every monad um, has a, associated with it a family of adjunctions. Um, the most uh, famous of which are associated with uh, the Kleisley category, but there's others, uh, for example, associated with the Allenberg Moore uh, category. Um, and we're going to be looking at uh, this link uh, between adjunctions and monads, which is, is so central, uh, and, and using that to build some intuition with respect to monads, which are uh, notoriously. Uh, elusive uh, for many, many practitioners. Um, now, it turns out that that's going to come around to, to this lecture as well, um, because it turns out that, um, uh, that monads um, will be uh, directly given by a monoidal category. Uh, they are monoids, um, and they're monoids in a very special category, a category where every object is an endofunctor and morphisms are natural transformations between them. By endofunctor, I just mean a functor from a category to itself. Um, and uh, for monads, um, the monoidal product, um, this thing which is going to be so central within this lecture, is going to be join. It's going to be something which um, takes, for example, a list of a list of ends and turns it into a, a list of events. It flattens it, um, or it takes a maybe of a maybe of, of bool, and it turns it into a, a bool. Um, uh, it's that joining operation, which is, um, which is often used in the very definition of a monad, um, in which is supported in Haskell and Scala, et cetera, um, which, uh, which ends up playing the role of the monoidal product. Um, so uh, here, we're going to be um, going on to monads uh, in, in our next lecture, but we'll be harking back to the material from, from this lecture and indeed the mineral category. So it's not the, another reason I want to emphasize mineral categories. And I also wanted to, to correct a, a certain um, element of my presentation last time that had some subtleties associated with it um, th and that may clear up uh, some confusion to ha uh, some confusion to have resolved. Okay, um, so that's our our goals for today. Uh, hopefully, it will build on uh, what we saw last time, but at the same time, extend it. So uh, I'm going to go over to my slides here, um, and we'll get going. Can you folks see my slides? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Um, and I'm glad to see further people uh, rolling in here. So, so again, uh, our goals here are to, to understand uh, monoids in the context of adjunction. Um, and here specifically, we're dealing with an adjunction between uh, two important categories. One category is the category of set. Um, and uh, within that category, we have an object representing each possible set. And we have morphisms between objects being uh, the things that transform one set to another, which are functions. They map each element of the source set into some particular element of the destination set. Um, so uh, here we have a familiar category, hopefully. Um, and 
we're going to be, uh, so that's one side of the adjunction. And then that's joined by a left functor here that it's a left adjoint, which maps from a given set S, any arbitrary set S into a monoid in the category mon, which is the category of monoids. Now, each object in this category is a monoid. Um, and I'll remind you what a monoid is in a minute, but basically it's associated with a set and uh, that set can be combined with a, a binary monoidal product operation to, to yield another element, which is, which must be in that set as well. Um, and there's an identity element as well um, that combined with any other with the mineral product operation per, uh, gives that, that other element. Um, so a given set here is mapped into a monoid and um, all objects in this category are monoids and morphisms between them are structure preserving mappings between them, what are called homomorphisms. Um, so they preserve, they honor um, that monoidal structure. Uh, so if we have uh, a, a morphism, call it, uh, call it G to avoid confusion with this F, uh, call it lowercase g from one monoid to another, um, then it has to be that if we start with two elements of the source monoid A and B, and we combine them with tensor products uh, with the, the, the monoidal operation of this source, uh, we get, and we then map it over, we have to get something that's the same, uh, same element of the destination monoid as we would have gotten by mapping A over, B over, and then combining them with the monoidal product in this, the monoidal operation in this destination monoid. Um, so it, it needs to honor that. It needs to turn a combination of elements over in the source monoid into a combination of the map, mappings of those, those two elements um, uh, in the, the destination monoid. So we have these various homomorphisms which, which honor it in this way. And this is a very common thing within category theory that will define a category uh, level up. But when we first started dealing with this, we were dealing with, um, uh, with monoids as a category and they look something like this. We had, uh, we had you know, uh, morphisms which, which encoded the, the elements. But then we'll have a, a category of these things and the morphisms between these things will be structure preserving morphisms. They'll be nice morphisms, morphisms that are true to that structure. Okay. And uh, there's a pattern you'll see again and again uh, within category theory when we define these higher level uh, uh, categories. Now, that's only one part of the adjunction, of course, because if we start with a monoid, um, we have a right functor that will map it back, a so-called underlying functor, into just the set associated with that monoid. Um, and so maybe this monoid is associated with um, two elements, zero and one, and addition mod two. Um, so you combine zero and zero, you get zero, zero and one, you get one, one and zero, you get one, and one and one, you get zero. Um, but when we, when we, pass it through the right functor, the underlying functor, all we get out is zero and one. That's all it preserves. So it strips away these other things. It's, it's the, called a forgetful functor. And so we name this whole thing free forgetful adjunction, okay? And, and the amazing thing is going to be that there's gonna be this isomorphism, this bijection, it's one-to-one -one mapping between these morphisms in set, which are numerous, and these homomorphisms. For any S and any M, there's got to be this, this relationship, this, this direct one-to-one -one mapping. Um, and it's because these uh, elements of set are mapped into a very special monoid, not any old vanilla monoid, 
they're mapped into free monoids. And free monoids have a very specific form, uh, which actually consists of lists or sequences. Um, uh, so if we have a set S, which has elements, it's going to be mapped into a monoid whose elements are going to be sequences, all possible sequences of elements drawn from that original set S. So if this uh, set S were, say, uh, just one element, zero, then the sequences would be empty string or empty sequence, you know, just zero by itself, uh, zero, 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 et cetera. Um, if S were zero and one, these would be sequences of all possible lengths from zero upwards of ones and zeros. Um, so all possible binary sequences, uh, including the, the, um, the empty one. Um, so this is gonna be our free forgetful adjunction. And um, I'm gonna be spending some time building intuition about why it is that there's this isomorphism. It's actually quite beautiful when you come to see it. Um, it makes sense, but it seems outlandish at first um, because set is a set with, is a category with very little structure and monoids have a lot of structure to them. Uh, only certain operations between them are, are legit, these homomorphisms. Okay, and I asked you re, uh, to look at originally some, some videos. Uh, I didn't ask for any new ones this past week. Okay, so just as a reminder and to recap what I've said and, and what was said last time, um, traditionally a monoid uh, is, is a triple uh, consisting of a set S, um, a monodal product, which is written as tensor product, but the word tensor is not important. It's just to avoid getting you out of that mindset of thinking of it as it's gotta be times or it's gotta be plus or gotta be concat or whatever. And then there's a, a unique unit element, which you could think of informally as the identity. Um, that's a good intuition because um, that's the role it will play. So, um, not only do we have this triple, but it, it has to obey certain constraints, certain conditions. So this monodal product operation um, has to be able to combine any two elements A and B in this set, that should be capital S, to obtain another element, um, which is uh, in capital S as well, okay? So uh, this is important. If we have any two elements in S and we, we hit them with this, uh, whoa, with this monodal product, we get another element that's in set. Um, and it has to be such that we have associativity, uh, which will play an outsized role. Um, but the unit element, this final element is such that it's distinguished by the fact that if we combine it with any other element of S, of capital S, we get that other element back, regardless of order. Uh, so A cross E is A, uh, E cross A is, e is A. Um, it's kind of like multiplying by one for the monoid of natural numbers uh, times and one, or combining with zero. If we're adding, we, we uh, combine it with any other element and we get that other element back. Um, and there's tons of familiar examples of these which are listed there, some of which may not be obvious to you. Um, but um, you may not have thought, for example, of power sets uh, of a given set as a monoid with union as its, uh, as its operation, but it, set, it plays that role. Um, now, monoids, uh, I noted last time, are, are used extensively in programming, and I argued that the associativity property, this property that we don't care about in what order operations uh, are in fact performed chronologically, the ordering is preserved in terms of their logical order. It's always A, B, C. The question is, you know, do we combine A and B first and then combine C or do we combine B and uh, A and then um, combine that with B and C? Um, uh, so, so here, uh, the, the fact that we have this freedom, we have this equivalence allows for us to exploit parallelism effectively. And there's all sorts of, of uh, ways in which we do 
uh, for example, um, reduction. So MapReduce protocol, which has been you know, so critical for processing of very large volumes of data within the context of, um, uh, of, of the internet, within the context of the, the, uh, the age of big data, um, make central use of this ability to take advantage of parallelism afforded by associativity. Um, and there's a variety of, you know, right, right, uh, you know, fold from the right, fold from the left, uh, scanning um, that that adds up successive elements, and in 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 a way that you get sort of uh, cumulative totals. Um, and uh, monoids have many particular instantiations, some of which correspond to this, but they include other things like uh, concatenation of strings or or appending of lists, um, and indeed um, uh, monads, uh, as I noted, form uh, form an operation. It turns out you can have um, uh, monoids associated with combination of functions as well, um, and uh, and certainly, if we're a bit loose about it, we can have it with things like disjoint union and 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 product pairing things up into tuples, for example as long as they're willing to regard these two as essentially equivalent as, um, to each other, uh, which they are from an isomorphism standpoint. If we have a, 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 a tuple of double and int nested inside um, a, a bigger one that also has a bool, it's, it's basically the same as this. We can convert losslessly from one to the other and back. Um, so, so monoids are everywhere and um, Monoidal product uh, is everywhere if one just gets out of the straitjacket of thinking that it has to be performed on numeric uh, things, for example. Um, okay, now um, I noted last time that monoids play this uh, big role in applied category theory. Um, and uh, we're going to see this uh, in the later part of this lecture when we talk about uh, monoidal categories and we talk about them as the gateway, for example, to monoidal functors and thereby lax monoidal functors that are basically identical to, um, to applicatives. Uh, and, and by virtue of the fact that they also lay the groundwork for modeling. Um, it turns out that, that uh, monoids also play this, this big role in, with monads uh, that will be the focus of, of quite a bit of discussion in our uh, next few lectures. Okay, so, so this was the definition of monoid in a set theoretic sense. Um, but normally in category theory, we like to, we like to provide alternatives to traditional characterization of quantities, uh, for example, in a set theoretic way, in a way that's, that's more categorical. Now, wh what I mean by that is it, it, it doesn't depend on knowing the internals of each object. It doesn't depend on talking about the elements uh, quite explicitly. It, it abstracts over uh, details uh, of the elements and indeed, when we're dealing with uh, the category mon, the, the, the category uh, associated with monoids, um, we'll be sort of glossing over how those elements are represented. And, and this will get to the correction I'll, I'll give later in this lecture um, compared to last time. So, so there we, we sort of collapse down. Um, we, we, we don't think, we abstract away from particulars of how elements are captured within a given object in MON. Uh, by contrast, um, within SET, uh, elements are made quite uh, explicitly. And um, the monoid category, the category where we represent monoids uh, explicitly as a category actually does break out the elements of the SET, okay? and um, here, I want to explicate this uh, a little bit better, I think, than I, than I did last time. Um, and again, it's worth thinking about as an exemplar because it's uh, a common, uh, common thing that comes up. So here we have, um, 
an extremely simple category by virtue of the fact that it's a single object. Um, there's no particular elements or structure to that object. It's just a, a sort of monolith. Um, and uh, it's just undifferentiated. Um, and elements in the monoid, true to the spirit of category theory here, are captured in morphisms, not objects. Um, so it's, it's really the, the morphisms here that delineate the elements of the monoid. Um, and uh, because there's only a single object, all morphisms uh, go from that object, star, back to itself. They're all circular. And by, by virtue of that, they can all be composed with one another. Normally, if we, have, if we have two morphisms in a category, we can't necessarily count on them being composable, being able to, to create their composition. So if A goes from, or if one morphism F goes from A to B and another goes from, you know, from C to D, we can't compose those two because they're not end to end as, as morphisms. Um, it's only if, if we have from A to B and B to C, for example, that we could compose them into something that's from A to C. Uh, but, and, and we talk about that for a general category as imposing some typing constraints. Um, uh, we have to have compatible types. The, the output of say the first morphism has to be uh, compatible with what the what's needed for the input for the second morphism. I'm, I'm speaking in a kind of lax way myself here uh, because we're not always dealing with functions, of course. Uh, but here, as Bartosz Mielewski comments, we're dealing with something similar to weak typing. Any morphism could be compared, composed with anything else. Um, so uh, any morphism goes from the singleton object to itself. So we could compose, for example, one with two to get their tensor product, okay? Um, and, uh, and remember, within a category, we can choose what composition means. When we compose any two morphisms, we can pick what other morphism it maps to. It has to map to some other morphism, but we, we have the latitude of picking um, which one. Um, and if you think about it collectively, the set of all morphisms from this undifferentiated single object, the star to itself represents the object, the elements of the monoid. So these are the elements of the, of the monoid here. This, there's this identity morphism, which is very special. And that corresponds to the unit of the monoid. And then you have these other elements of the monoid, each corresponding to a particular morphism from star to itself. Um, now, this gives a, a correspondence here um, to, to the uh, traditional notion of monoids and set. So our monoids as a set. So here's monoids as a set. We have a set S, and those are all the components here, all the dots, as it were, all the, all the, all the objects, if you want to think about it that way. Um, we have a tensor product operation and we have a, a distinguished uh, identity element E. And really the monoid as a category is mapping this identity morphism for, because all objects in a category have to have identity morphisms. It's mapping that to this unit in the monoid over here. So that's the role it plays. I'm trying to indicate a correspondence here. This monoid as a category is this, it just, it represents it in a kind of funky way, but it's it's the same thing. It's just just you know different labels for things, different names for things, but it's the same. The rose smells just as sweet by any other name. So this plays the role of E. Um, a given a given morphism in monoid as a category, say F, maps to a particular element of S, which I've called A and B here, for example. Um, uh, so F might be A and maybe G is B. Um, now what, what then we have further is this composition serves as the monoidal operation. So what's a monoidal operation over here, like A cross B or a tensor product B uh, corresponds to F 
uh, tensor G. Here we have F being A, G being B. And so F composition with G, F after G goes into A tensor B over here, okay? Um, so we have a one-to-one -one correspondence. Anything that's a tensor over here, a combination of these things, um, uh, corresponds to their to their composition here. So if we know the rules of combination over here in a in a monoid um, in in set, if we know A and B combined to be C, for example, then we know. Uh, their corresponding morphisms over here, monoid as a category, F and G have to course have to compose to be the morphism associated with C. And we can go back and forth, back and forth. Every object or every element of S corresponds to a morphism over here in the monoid as a category. And every composition over here with tensor product um, or every combination with tensor product corresponds to a composition over here in monoid as a category. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence between them. The rules of combination with tensor product are encoded in the rules that we choose when defining a category of composition of these morphisms uh, within this category. So we simply, ch we simply choose composition when we define this category to give us the same results of combining morphisms as those the objects corresponding to those morphisms have or the elements associated with those morphisms have within S when we combine them with, uh, with tensor product. Um, and of course, combining anything over in a, a, mon a monoid in a category with the identity morphism gives that same thing back. So if we combine identity with F, we get F back by the definition of a category. Uh, and the same thing is true over here because identity maps to E and E combined with anything else gives that, a, that other thing. Um, so we have that element of, of um, identical behavior also guaranteed by the rules of categories. And the final element of monoid as a set that's guaranteed is associativity. And you may remember that associativity is guaranteed within the context of a category by the very definition of a category. The, the combination of um, morphisms uh, made possible through composition has to be an associative one. It must be an associative one to be a legitimate category. And so that allows the category to capture that key feature of a monoid. The category is just another way of encoding uh, this, this monoid. It's just a particularly curious way that you have the same exact information present in S, the rules for monoidal product and, and knowing about this, um, this unit. Uh, you're just encoding it in a different way uh, within this category. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence between them. Okay, so this is monoid uh, as a, uh, the monoid category. Um, and uh, it's a quite beautiful, um, uh, quite beautiful uh, relationship between them. Um, but it's one that uh, has subtlety associated with it. Uh, and we're going to see that subtlety in a bigger form with, with free monoids uh, in just a few minutes here. But I want to go through a, a little example here. So for example, we might have monoid as a category um, and we might have a particular monoid instead of dealing with you know, A and B, I'm gonna deal with you know, the monoid of natural numbers. So zero and up uh, as integers uh, plus, to combine them and zero. And you know, here we're gonna have, well, what's the unit of this monoid? It's, it's zero. I mean, it's given right there. And anything we combine with zero with plus, we get that other thing back. So here we're gonna have a mapping from identity functor to zero. Um, now, uh, beyond that, 
we're going to have some some additional structure within this monoid. So for example, uh, this is structure not present in a free monoid, but is present here. Um, we're going to get, for example, while some elements can only be produced or are sort of singular and can't be produced with anything else, one be an example, zero be an example, we can get two um, uh, through combining one plus one. And in fact, kind of in a, in a vacuous way in either order, three can be gotten by one plus two or two plus one. Um, we could remember the monoidal um, uh, tensor operation, it cares about order in general, but here we're collapsing the two. We're saying, hey, one plus two is the same, just consider one plus two the same as two plus one. We didn't have to do that. There's nothing about the, the monoidal rules that force it. If you go back and you look at the monoidal rules, there's nothing that says, you know, A plus A tensor B has to be B tensor A. No, 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 no. It's, it's associativity is something different. It's about where you put the parentheses. It's not about flipping the orders between things. Uh, students often get that confused, but there's nothing that forced this upon us by the rules of a monoid, but we elected by the rules of plus to collapse these things together, to consider one plus two the same as two plus one. And that's three here, right? Um, uh, four can be gotten, you know, even more ways. Two plus one, one plus three, three plus one. You know, we we have um, uh, a bunch of uh, identities, a bunch of structure we further imposed on this that we didn't have to by the rules of monoids. But the monoid as a category that corresponds to this will capture this structure. So, for example, over here. While in general, we, we don't have to have any particular morphisms identified more that are implied by the, um, by the rules of, uh, of, of categories. Uh, here we, we will. And so for example, two, the morphism two, the light blue one um, will be, will define it to be equal to this morphism composed with this morphism. So if we go this morphism and we go twice, their composition, we can compose them because they go back, to, they start and go back to the same point. We compose them, we will, we will have this morphism, okay? Um, this morphism up here, this red one, you could get either by going two and then one or one and then two um, and you'll get, this red one, this three, um, and that reflects this thing here. And and you know the uh, the four morphism. I didn't even uh, label uh, all the different ways, but it's two after two, or it's three after one, or it's one after three. Um, we could get this, and this is all encoded in our elective rules for what composition means in this category we have to be able to compose any two morphisms in a way that yields a morphism that is in this category. That's, that's enforced by, by the rules of categories. But, but we elected to collapse these. We didn't have to. A free monoid wouldn't collapse these, but we did. We collapsed these so that we could, we could characterize these same rules. So this monoid as a category encodes these rules which um, uh, you know are for this particular monoid. So when we have monoid as a category, we use the rules that are forced by category, uh, by the laws of categories, to um, um, to to capture essential features of monoids. Things like associativity, things like uh, the the unitality. That if we combine with 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 the unit we get back the same thing. Um, it serves as kind of identity. Um, uh, and, and the fact that a combination of any two elements is guaranteed to be in the category. Those are all enforced by categorification, by the rules of categories. But then we choose artfully our rules for composition 
to mirror as we see fit the rules of the monoid that we're trying to capture here. And that involves collapsing things that don't have to be collapsed. Um, and, and for a free monoid, we're not going to have to um, collapse uh, collapse them. Okay, so you know, just emphasizing this point, if we have um, encodings here, you know, for this, if we encoded this monoid, that's what we did here. You know, ID means zero. Um, that's the identity, and in composing morphism three and two will be five. If we were trying to capture instead of this one, we're trying to capture this one. The identity here would mean one. We would define it to mean, hey, that's that's one. Um, and composing three and two uh, as morphisms, three and two over here, um, so in particular morphisms encoding three and two would yield the morphism for six, right? We choose our rules for composition that we impose to, to guarantee that. Um, it has to be in the category, but we could choose when we compose F and G, what other morphism it gives. Uh, and same thing with max, et cetera. Um, um, so, so this is sort of the semantics of different monoids over here. We'll, we'll map them to our category in different, uh, different ways with different rules for what composition means, for example, what identity means. Um, OK. Um, Right, so I had some, you know, examples of monoids. You you saw this one. This this one might um, might encode this. It's a little bit flat as an example because it doesn't um, it doesn't so visually what these things combine to. But this might be a table of what G composed after F is for for all these different things. And if you kind of look at this with a gimlet eye, you'll quickly discover this is plus. Uh, this is plus on natural numbers, is encoded in this composition table that we choose for our category. Here, if you look at this, you'll find, oh, this is just addition mod two. Um, so we have zero and one. And if we combine zero and zero, we get zero, zero and one, we get one, one and zero, one and one and one, zero. Um, okay, now, um, these are example sort of monoids as categories. Now, I, I wanna talk about mon monoid homo homomorphisms. Um, so monoid uh, homomorphisms are carried out with, uh, with functors. And functors between monoids are going to preserve the essential features of what's needed for a homomorphism to exist between the monoids. So if we have a category C, which has an identity, uh, the property of a functor from C to D guarantees that that identity is mapped in C to uh, so the identity morphism in C is mapped to an, a corresponding identity morphism in D. The object gets mapped to an object from an object from C gets mapped to an object from D, and an identity morphism from that object to itself gets mapped to the identity morphism from the the mapping of that object in, in category D to itself. That's that's great. That's guaranteed by functoriality by the rules of functors. Um, but more than that, um, we, we need for a homomorphism to have this nice property. Uh, I, I stated it early on, but basically, look, we can, if we pick any two objects over here in C and we combine them, we combine them with our monoidal operation in C and we map that over, that has to give the same thing as mapping over those two objects first and then combining them in D. The, the two categories have to kind of mirror each other and the functor has to map them um, in a way that, that guarantees this correspondence. It's, it's not that D is exactly the same as C, it could coarse grain it, but um, it has to behave in a, in a way that's at least compatible with it. For example, D could, could be a single object and F could map everything 
onto that object. Um, and uh, I could map every morphism, for example, uh, onto the yeah, identity morphism over here, indeed. But, um, uh, but we have to have this property um, preserved. Uh, and it turns out that this is exactly the rule that we get when we consider tensor product to be composition. So this rule is guaranteed by for a functor if we have tensor product being composition. Um, uh, so if we consider any two morphisms over here in C and we consider their composition and we map that over with a functor F, we have to get something which is the results of combining the morphism mapped over, the two morphisms mapped over and composing them in D. Um, and so functors are structure preserving here. They, they, they preserve the functoriality. And when you have tensor products being, being a composition over in C, like we do here, it's mapped over into composition in D in a way that's guaranteed by functoriality, by the rules of functors, you have to have it be the case. And so functors uh, serve this role uh, between monoids, serve this role of homomorphisms. They map between these, um, between these, these categories. And so if we have this category of, of monoids, um, you know, each of these is one of uh, one of these categories can be mapped over. Uh, uh, it's a monoid, and these arrows are are homomorphisms between them that that preserve this structure, much as this functor preserves this structure. Um, and this mapping between these um, abstracts away from the particulars of how we encode within each of these dots, it's monoidal structure. I showed it with, with some loops last time. And, and it's true that, that that's actually really interesting uh, structure, uh, the mappings between them and uh, the actions that the pre-actions and post-actions. But, but in general, when you're dealing with a category of, of, of monoids, you're abstracting over exactly how is this monoidal structure captured but the morphisms between them have to be structure preserving. They have to preserve that structure and the properties associated with these, these monoids. Um, and those are the only morphisms in here. Um, and so these are all monoids and these are structure preserving mappings or homomorphisms between these, these monoids. Okay, um, so this was some basics on, on monoids. Um, now I want to go on to free monoids, but I thought I'd I'd pause here and ask: Are there any questions about anything I've covered here about this basic monoid category in its correspondence to monoid in a set theoretic sense? Any questions about this? Going once, going twice, okay, gone. Um, okay, so uh, we'll, we'll now get into the issue of free monoids, um, which will um, hopefully build on some of that uh, intuition, but take it further. Um, there's some things it won't need from this exposition that we've just seen. So, one of the motivations for dealing with free monoids is, is, in fact, the whole adjunction context with which I've introduced this topic, right? We have set, and we have this adjunction from set to monoids. Um, and free monoids crop up in this context. Um, each set is mapped to a, not just any old monoid, but a free monoid. Um, and 
in the adjunction, we're reasoning about the homsets. We're reasoning about these, these morphisms um, in each of these categories. So, so the, the rules for adjunctions guarantee this isomorphism. So if we, we, if we pick any old set S and we pick any old morphism M, oh, sorry, any old morphism, sorry, any old monoid M. So any old set and set, any old monoid M in category of monoid, monoids, this, this category M, um, then this property has to hold true. That's guaranteed by the rules of adjunction. Okay, so if we map S uh, over to LS and we consider the the monoid homomorphisms between that mapping uh, down to M, those have to be on a one-to-one -one basis with and a bijection with um, uh, and an isomorphism with the homomorphisms you get from mapping M over to set and going from S to M, okay? Um, now here uh, over in monoid, uh, the things linking up LS, this mapping of S over and, and the object M, which we picked, the monoid M, which we picked, the arbitrary monoid, um, those were homomorphisms. Over in set, these morphisms are what? What are morphisms in set? They are, it begins with F, they are functions. 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 Um, so they map each element of the sort set S to some particular element of M. And these can be all sorts of functions, functions of a of a most unusual and sometimes unseemly uh, type. I don't know. I've never met probably a function I didn't like, but um, uh, but I, I, I guess it could be unseemly. Um, so, um, so, 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 you know, this is an interesting and almost provocative um, statement that you pick an S, you pick an M, and I will guarantee you this correspondence. Um, now, the other thing that's part of this, though, is the very particular mappings, the adjoints, which which are a key part that guarantee this. So it, it has to be very specific adjoints. The adjoint going to the left, mapping from the set to the to to the monoid here, LS, is is the free functor. So it maps any old set to be a free monoid based on that set. And we'll see what that is. But the other functor is the underlying functor. It takes any old monoid M you've picked and it extracts, it extracts the um, the set, which is part of that monoid. Um, so uh, any old monoid is associated with some set. Here we encoded that set in a set of morphisms, but but here we're abstracting over how it's encoded. It's, it's just some old set um, there, whether it's encoded in hum set or whatever internally, it doesn't matter. It's some old set. It has some set as part of the monoid. And we extract that, and that's what RM is. Okay, um, so we're extracting. That's the underlying functor, the forgetful functor, and we write the adjunction like this: monoid is left uh, left adjunct uh, adjoint to set. Okay, um, this is called the left adjoint functor, and this is the right adjoint functor. Okay, now last time I said, look, um, we talk about a free monoid, but um, if we really start to, to buckle down and, and get down to brass tacks and think about think about how free can a free monoid be, we find that there's actually some some hidden constraints. Uh, we find that there's some secret shackles. Um, well, not so secret, but there's some shackles that maybe aren't aren't obvious immediately. Um, so so let's. Let's imagine trying to build up as much freedom as we we can here. So we, you know, we we know we have to have identity morphism. That's given to us. That's handed to us by the rules of 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 uh, of categories. And that's what we're dealing with here. We're only gonna for a free monoid. We're dealing 
it's free, not in the sense that it doesn't cost any money. Um, um, it's free in the sense that there's minimal restrictions on it. There's only the restrictions attendant upon being a category. And so we're trying to figure out what things are allowed in the rules of a category for a monarch. And one thing we know we have given to us for any category is we have an identity morphism. That much is given. So we have to be dealing with that. And I actually even haven't put that in here because it'll be it'll be incredibly numerous um, if I if I put every combination with identity in. Um, but we know that it's a given that if you combine identity with any other morphism, you get that other morphism back. Okay, so so our hands are tied on that, right? We, we can't do anything about saying for my category, my free monoid identity combined with F is gonna equal G. No, 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 we can't do that. Um, we, we have to have identity with F gives back F, okay? Um, if we have a morphism and we combine it with identity from the left or the right, we have to get the, that same morphism back, okay? But but we have some some latitude here. For example, um, maybe we have morphism F. How do we combine that morphism? Uh, well, we know we combine with identity and get it back. How do we combine it with itself? So we had sort of F combined with F, right? Uh, and if we think about it in a categorical way here, it's it's um, you know F F uh, after F, right? With with composition. Again, here. It, it, we don't have to think of it in, in this way. We're abstracting over what it is, but let's just think about it that way, you know, for, for building our intuitions with this as a category. So F combined with F, well, we don't have to have that be identity or have to have that be F. There's, there's nothing about categories that say that. So we'll give it a new name, G, okay? We're gonna, we're gonna call it G, great. We're gonna call it G. Um, we're being max minimally restricted. If we have the opportunity to call it something different, we will. Um, unless it's forced upon us, we don't reuse things. So now we have F and G, great, great. Okay, so suppose we combine F and G now. Um, well, <clears throat> if we combine F and G, is there anything forcing us to, to give back something we already have like F? or G, uh, if you think about it, no, no, there's, there's nothing that <clears throat> forces that to be G. It doesn't force it to be F, so we'll call it H. Okay, great. So, so now we've got G and we've got H and the road is open in front of us. The sky is wide open. Um, uh, we are in Saskatchewan after all. Um, so we got H, great. Um, but now let's deal with G and F, because remember that's not necessarily the same, G and F. Well, okay, now, wait a minute. Now, uh, you, might, you might think we could call that I, but, but hold your horses uh, because F we know is, uh, well, F, F is kind of our building block, F. G we know is F combined with F. So if we have G, we have basically G, uh, G being FF. That's what it was, it was defined as, at the composition of F and F. And now we're combining it with F again. And we know by the rules of associativity that this needs to be the same as F combined with FF. And guess what this is? Anyone recognize what's F combined with FF? It's what? H. Uh, F combined with uh, F, sorry, F combined with FF is F, is H. Yes, <laughs> it is H exactly, and it's because FF is what G. FF was G. We combined G was F combined with F, so so that's that's G right there. So FG by the rules of associativity, if we have to be able to forget where the parens are without worry. We can erase the parens without worry that it's ambiguous. We need clearly F combined with FF to be the same as FF combined with F. And FF is none other than G. 
we combined f and f to be to be g um and and uh so this is saying fg equals gf so we're going to have to reuse h we we can't allocate a new name for it because it, it's got to be h by the rules of associativity if we combine f okay now 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 we're getting some constraints imposed by us by the rules of category now let's consider uh, the rules of being a category now let's consider g okay we got g we had allocated it before uh, i'm speaking like a like a computer scientist here okay so g combined with g um uh is there anything that forces it to be anything else um uh to to be something else well we have uh uh if we if we think about the associativity side this is kind of like ff combined with ff um there's nothing that particularly requires a, a separate thing so we'll call it i and as you go down through this with kind of similar reasoning um you can end up you know recognizing things that have got to be the same for example f and h is just f and then fg here um because h is just uh f after g and so uh we, we've by associativity we have to be able to move these things we know ff is g so we know that um, this has to be the same as gg so we have to reuse i and i think you see kind of the type of reasoning we're going back and look at these definitions of earlier ones in terms of what they represented and and the associativity rules are the ones that keep on getting us they keep on imposing these restrictions they keep on forcing us to reuse things to be a legit category the fact that we have to be able to erase these parens without any ambiguity um forces our hand and forces us to reuse some things so i've i've shown in black all the things which can be newly allocated and the things in magenta are things that we end up uh reusing we have to reuse because of rules of associativity and uh what you end up finding is that the rules of associativity do constrain you actually a fair bit um in order to be a legit category um we can't allocate you know, just say willy nilly M combined with Z is going to be, you know, omega or something like that. It's we we've we've got to actually accord with these rules that um, that uh, bind us uh, quite tightly in terms of associativity. Um, now, the thing I didn't get to last time, but which is a key point, is. If you go through this exercise, and it's a fun exercise to go through, at least in my definition of fun, uh, um, what you what you end up realizing is, you know, it's all about the associativity, um, and you're always unpacking things in terms of their earlier um, definitions here, and the earlier definitions, if you really unpack them. What you get down to more and more, um, you know, if, if you go to, for example, um, K is G and I. What is G? Well, G is F and F. And uh, what is I? I is G and G. And each of G is F and F. You're getting different sequences all composed of this element F, okay? Sort of the primordial element uh, F here, the primordial non identity element. Um, F, um, it, you know, it, it all gets unpacked in terms of sequences of, of F. Um, and if you go through this, uh, what you find is that the things that were newly allocated, um, what, G, H, I, J, K, um, are none other than successive sequences, unique sequences of this primordial non non identity element f that we started with which we started um and and that should give you pause for thought because all these other ones that ended up being reused 
that that's just because we are putting parentheses in different places within these sequences. So maybe we had, you know, uh, F and then uh, FF and then FF for this one. And, or another one, we had FF together and then FF and then F. Or maybe we had FF and then F and then FF. Um, so so we, these, these other ones were kind of arbitrary parentheses that because of associativity, yeah, 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 okay, fine. It's just the same thing. Really, this is the essence of it. It's the sequences. The sequences are the elements being named anew in this monoid. Um, in this monoid, in, the, in this free monoid, um, the elements of the free monoid are nothing other than these sequences. And I'd include in here F itself, and I'd include in here the identity as the empty element. After all, the identity combined with anything else gives itself, which is the same as concatenating sequences. So, so what we're seeing actually emerge from this, from a, a free monoid is composition within this or, or monoidal product of two things, of two morphisms, basically consisting of the concatenation of the sequences associated with them. And in this case, it's, it's unary sequences, the so sequences of this F, this F thing. Um, okay, so if we have a monoid, so, so here, this minimal free monoid, it's kind of one we tried to build up to develop our intuitions about what's free in it. We found that the things that are free, that were free to be different, are each possible sequence of, of this kind of primordial non-identity element. But in general, ladies and gentlemen, if we think about this mapping, uh, the free monoid for a given set, the free monoid corresponding to that set, is going to use, as it were, as, and I'll speak informally using the term here as generators, um, uh, for it, the elements of F, I'm oh, sorry, the elements of S. We used F as our kind of, our, again, informal generator here. Uh, and we got sequences of, of Fs as the elements. If we have a monoid, sorry, if we have a set S and we turn into a free monoid, what we're going to get out are, we're not going to start with just F, we're going to start with each element of S uh, as being kind of a primordial element um, that can be combined in these sequences. And anything can be reduced ultimately to some element of, some sequence of elements of S. Um, and therefore, any, any set X, S, gets mapped into a monoid, who's a free monoid, whose elements consist of sequences of, of elements drawn from that original set S. So, so maybe the set S here was, um, and I thought I, I might have a nice uh, illustration of this, but maybe the set S is zero and one. And again, I, I said it earlier, but I'll say it again in this context because we're spiraled back to it. Um, if, if, if S is the set zero and one, then we're going to have elements of the free monoid LS be sequ all possible sequences of zero and one, all possible binary sequences, including the empty one. If S is just zeros, we'll have all possible unary sequences. That's what we add here, right? Um, if S is three possible things, um, you know, three, three elements, we'll have all possible sequences of those three elements. So, you know, if those three elements are ABC, we'll have, you know, uh, we'll have empty, empty sequence and then we'll have A or we'll have B or we'll have C, and then we'll have, you know, AA and AB and AC and BA and BC, uh, et cetera. Um, 
uh, sequences of all different lengths of those. Um, okay, so um, uh, you know here we have we have this for a set S, and I, I've called it. Um, um, I, I, I should have been more careful here. This is actually a bit screwed up. Um, uh, so I, this should really say if we have a uh, S, uh, a set S, um, L. So I'm, I'm just uh, going to accord with um, with what's in the diagram to avoid uh, confusing you. Um, so uh, sorry about that, but basically, if we have a set S, LS consists uh, is the free monoid on set S, which can be expressed as S star. And some of you may recognize this. Where have you seen this clean, cleaning star or clean enclosure uh, of S? Where have you seen this before? It's actually featured in 214, of all things, um, as part of the teaching there. It comes up in what? Regular expressions. Regular expressions. If you have a set, you know, and you say, um, take the character, you know, digit star, right? Um, sometimes the regular expression languages have a special encoding for digits, and you you could, you know, backslash d or something star, right? It it just means it any possible sequence of zero or more of these. Um, that's exactly what this is. This is the, the from the free free monoid. Um, uh, so here, um, this this equivalence uh, it 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 bears noting that uh, for the monoid, this free monoid, the empty sequence is it serves as e. Concatenation of two sequences serves as monoidal product. Um, and the identification of the elements as sequences, um, uh, ignoring whence they came, you know, uh, for example, whether they were built up originally as F tensor G, then tensor H, or whether it was built up as F tensor G tensor H. Regardless of that, we're dealing with them as sequences. Um, we're, we're imposing by virtue of abstracting away from how they're built up and just dealing with them as sequences, we're imposing associativity. We don't care about how they're built up. All we care about, we don't care where the parentheses are or were. All we care about is, is the sequence uh, that emerges, right? Um, uh, and uh, as long as it's the same sequence, it doesn't matter uh, how it built up. Um, that's that's what we're we're capturing over here, and that's why that's a monoid. Um, uh, so it's it's a very natural mapping. Now, what this means, though, and 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 this will start to hopefully start to build some intuition um, for this this next stage uh, is you could start to understand this equivalence better. So. Um, you know, the quandary that I think Bartosz Mieluski explains quite well here, the kind of paradox that, that, that seems to apply here is that, look, um, on the one hand, um, you have these, this category set, right? Um, and remember, I said for an adjunction, you can pick the set S, you can pick M, and I guarantee that this is the case. And, and this is a strong guarantee. It's saying, that if you pick, you give me S and you give me M that you've picked. M is from on, uh, is a monoid and S is a set here. Um, I can guarantee you that if S is mapped over into monoid, that the, the homomorphisms between LS and, and you, the M you picked uh, have a one-to-one -one correspondence to the morphisms, that is the functions between S and, and the mapping of the M you picked uh, over to set by just forgetting, forgetting its monoidal structure and just taking it set. It's a one-to-one -one correspondence, and, and you could be excused for saying, you know, how could that possibly be? Look, um, sets here have have you know incredibly 
incredibly numerous numbers of functions between them. Um, uh, they, they have uh, functions that are nasty ones in terms, uh, you know, as well as really nice ones. They have, they have all sorts of weird functions that, uh, that do strange things and, um, and that don't have seeming rhyme or reason associated with, uh, with their rules. Um, but meanwhile, homomorphisms are very uh, kind of uh, uh, very rigid or very, uh, it's not rigid, they're, they're very structured quantities. They, they preserve monoidal structure. They're very disciplined about preserving that structure. And yet we have this somehow this isomorphism between them and, and, and how could that be? Um, uh, it, it seems at one level as a paradox, but I, I would argue there's, there's good intuition here. And I'm gonna try to help you build up that ish, intuition. And we're gonna look at some particular examples and you'll see why this has to be the case, hopefully. You'll see where it comes from. Okay, so the first intuition I wanna build up is, look, while this might seem implausible, well, it might seem that this is an, a, a, you know, a, a very, narrowly defined set, and this is a, a broad set, you have to realize that S gets mapped to a free monoid. It, S doesn't get mapped, and any old, you pick the S, any one of them is gonna be mapped to free monoids. And free monoids are not any old monoid. Free monoids have a very particular structure. And they have a structure that's, that's quite expansive, if I could, or a, they have elements that are quite expansive. You may have a set that has one element, one, one single element, and it gets mapped to a free monoid that has unlimited number of elements. I mean, it has arbitrary number. Of, it, has an it has a countable infinity of elements, right? It, it has every possible sequence of that element. It has empty set, it has uh, the element, uh, the, the singleton uh, sequence, it has, uh, two uh, two things of that, three, four, and, and, and so on, without bounds. So set, a, a given set might be very small, but it gets mapped to an unbounded free monoid uh, set in the free monoid that it, to which it corresponds. Um, so, L, you know, for a given set X, L of X can be far, far, far larger than X. Um, now, a second thing to realize though, um, so, so that's a key thing. We, we've got tons of elements being generated out here. That surely gives us a certain bit of latitude, right? Um, in, in, in thinking about this. Now, secondly, remember that M here, this isn't necessarily to, 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 to build intuition why this has to be the case, this isomorphism, but just a good reminder, M could be any old monoid. You pick the M. So, you can give me a free monoid or you can give me a non-free monoid. And most monoids are not free. Most monoids have a lot more structure than free monoids. And so, so it need not be a free monoid, right? Um, but the sequences in LS can often be kind of mapped to that monoid in, in a number of different ways. And as we'll see, those ways are in one-to-one -one correspondence with these ways. Okay, so let's see that. Um, okay, so here's the thing. Um, we, we, we said it here, but I'll, I'll say it again. If you, um, okay, so um, maybe I have a bit of a, a better explanation here, but um, so if we have two sets X and Y, let, let's think about this. Okay, suppose you have a set X, um, and you have a set y, and you're considering all the functions x to y here, okay? Um, how many such functions do we have? Well, um, it turns out uh, if x and y are sets, you have this many functions, the size of set y to the power of the size of set x. Now, you may think, well, that's, it's not obvious, and you may forget which x is in the exponent, which is in the base. But, but humor me this, the way I actually uh, remember this very, very readily 
is I don't just memorize it's what you know y at the bottom the, the the codomain at the bottom the domain at the top well after a while you develop that intuition but but no you you could think look okay imagine y is just zero and ones it's just binary digits right um x is mapping from each element of x to a binary digit surely we have like two to the something number of possibilities right because because each of these source ones can be mapped to a zero and one. So we're going to basically get out sequences of, 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 of binary digits. And there's two to the so many possible sequences. So it's got to be, if Y is binary digits is of size two, the two has to be in the base here. It's not in the, in the exponent. Um, and, and that's the way you can remember, okay, this thing is in the base. Um, but there's these many functions and that holds true of, Y is binary or not, right? And encodes zero and ones or encodes, a, you know, a, a huge number of different possibilities. This is the number of functions, okay? And it's, it's, it's look, uh, you know, um, each of these, um, uh, each of these, uh, mumble, um, so this should have, um, this should be, um, this should be UM here, sorry. Um, um, so, so each of these elements of X can pick any of these elements Y, right? This is the, the Y set is so unrestricted. I mean, it can, or set fun functions and set are so unrestricted. Um, they can pick for each X value of X, they can pick any value of Y. Um, and, and therefore, uh, you know, for the, First of them, we have maybe maybe y is two, right? And so, um, for the first element of x, we have two possibilities, and for the second element of x, we have well, we have those two, but if we consider also the the second element of x, we have two times two because the second element of x could be mapped to either one two, uh, as well, um, and the third element of x could be mapped to any of the y's as well. Um, and so for each element of X successively, you're multiplying by two, right? You're multiplying by, in general, uh, the cardinality of Y. Um, so if Y is of size two, you're multiplying two times two times two times two X times, uh, X count of things in X times. For every possible value, for every, every element of X, you have this multiplication. And that's why another reason you can you could see that. So. The sets, these functions don't offer any particular structure. You can see it right there. I mean, look, you can pick any value of X to be any of values of Y, um, you know, without constraint. It's, there's no structure really that's that's uh, being captured there. So we have this, um, th this thing here. Now, um, oh, you know what? Um, okay, um, I should have, um, no, so this shouldn't have been changed back because I should have noted here. Okay, so so look, um, uh, here we're going to be dealing with with this mapping, and we're going to be reasoning about the the cardinality here. Um, okay, so let's reason about S to R M. What is R M doing? Well, for a monoid, an arbitrary monoid, you picked um, all all the underlying functor is doing, all the forgetful functor is doing is extracting the set from that monoid, okay? Um, and, uh, and so if this monoid over here is, is defined to be X with this tensor product E, if that's what this monoid is, if, if it is associated with subset X of, of its elements, um, whether it's encoded or you know, in morphisms or not is irrelevant. If it's some set X of elements, RM is gonna be X, right? Um, and, um, oh my, uh, yeah. So I said R, but I should have said U here. In any case, it's, it's, it's the same thing as U. U equals R, okay? It's the underlying functor, the right functor. Um, okay, so, so this is of size this, I mean, by the same argument I just gave. These functions have, for each element of S, you have to pick an element of UM, right? Um, and UM 
or Rm is x. Okay, um, so, so we know that. We know all about functions between things. We know there's that many because there's no structure to capture. Okay, now let's consider mon. This is, this is a trickier one. Okay, so we've got this ls. Oh man, we got, we got this free monoid associated with s. What is that? What is the free monoid? What are the elements of the free monoid associated with s? Can anyone say? I said it earlier. What are the free elements of the free monoid associated with s? What are the elements associated with the free monoid um, that's, that's created when we map S uh, over into LS? What, what is LS? The elements of it are what? Um, is it S? Or, or what? S, so the, so the elements in S. Oh, one, one. Okay, but they're all sequences of those elements, right? This, this is what I said earlier. So LS, if we have a set S, LS is the free monoid on set S consisting of elements that are, are strings of sequences of elements from S. So yeah, I, I, I was a little bit ambiguous in the way that asked that. And it's, it's a terrible thing in English, the word element, um, the elements of the sequences are from S, but LS is a monoid whose elements in terms of being a monoid, um, it, each monoid is associated with a set. And that set has in it one element for each possible sequence of items from set. So if S is again zero and ones, LS has as its set, the empty sequence, zero, one, and then, Zero one, or sorry, zero 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 one one zero one one, and then zero 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 one, and and so on. Yeah. Um. Um. So. So here, um. We we have elements of LS as a monoid, um, that are are all all sequences of elements drawn from S. Um, I don't know why I said unary. That's all sequences. Um, that's horrible. Um, so FS, um, oh man, or LS, um, I, I'm gonna call it, oh man. I, 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 uh, um, okay, this is, this is bad because here I call it LS. Uh, I'm going to call it LS just to to lower confusion, um, and and now I'm now I'm in trouble because it appears a couple more places here. Um, uh, the reason it's the same thing is because the left adjoint is the free adjoint, and so sometimes I call it L, sometimes I call it S, and you know that's I'm a bad boy. Um, okay, so this. Um, this set of homomorphisms um, uh, are going to need to map from the monoid whose elements are all sequences of elements drawn from S um, uh, down to M, right? Um, and uh, each of these elements of the possible elements of S, um, so each of these elements uh, from S, which are mapped over here, these sequences are of those elements. So if we had zero one here, we'll have binary sequences here of zero and ones. If we had just zero here, we'll have unary sequences of just zeros, um, including in both cases, the empty one. If we had turn, if zero one two, we'd have sequences of zero one twos here. Um, and, every length from zero upwards, right? Um, but, but here, each element of a sequence, it turns out, can be mapped onto any element here drawn from, from this set uh, M. So when we're mapping with a monoid homomorphism, basically what we're doing um, 
observing associativity and so on, is we're mapping each possible element of the sequence. Those elements are, are from S, like we're mapping zero and one. If S is zero and one, we're mapping zero to some element from M, um, from the set X in M. Um, we're mapping one to some element to, uh, from the set X in M, from the same set. Uh, you picked M, but it has some underlying set associated with it, X. And each of these elements of LS, which are the elements of S, is being mapped to a particular value from that X, okay? Um, that's, that's really what's going on in the, in the homomorphism. Um, and and uh, by so doing, we basically can dictate how the whole sequence, by, by dictating how each element of S is mapped onto the elements of M in X here, because that's what X is, it's the elements of M. Um, by dictating for every element of S, then we can figure out how to map the whole sequence, the whole sequence down to M, because the whole sequence will just be the monoidal combination using this monoidal operation in M of all those mappings of the individual elements of the sequences, which were all drawn from S, uh, the individual elements. Um, so, so really, that's what's that's the essence of what's going on here. And because for each of the elements of S, which are the elements in the sequences LS, we have a choice of X possible possibilities for how to map it. The you know zero could be mapped. Maybe X down here is A B C, um, and and S is zero one. So there's going to be here a homomorphism, which maps zero to A and one to A. There's gonna be another one that maps zero to B and one to A. There's gonna be another one which maps zero to A and one to B, etc. And so for each of the elements of S, each and every one of them, I have free reign to pick any element of M, of, of the set associated with M, which is the set X, um, to which to map it. So I have two possibilities. Or, well, in that case, I have three possibilities for zero. I could map it to A, B, or C, right? Three possibilities. I could map one to A, B, and C. So there's a total of three times three or nine possibilities. And in general, for each, each element of S, I have X possibilities. So I have X to the S different possible mappings, which is exactly the same, which is exactly the same as you have obtaining over here and mapping from this into that. And the reason this all works is because you have the monoidal operation down here on M, which puts all these, if you know how to map each particular element of these sequences, all of those elements were drawn from S, then you know, whoa, you know how to map the whole sequence by combining it up, by folding it up using this monoidal operation here. And you'll get a mapping for the, for the whole thing. Um, Okay, so um, so let's let's go through a few examples of this, if we could. Um, um, so uh, here, um, so we're going to look at this for some particulars. So suppose S is some singleton set, just some set with a single element in it. We'll call it star. Um, and maybe M is a singleton monoid. You gave me some low balls. You picked S to be particularly simple and you picked M 
to be particularly simple. Ooh, that's that's nice. That's easy. Well, okay. So so let's do the set one first. This is pretty easy. Look, from the set one, we have one element in this set, and the underlying set of M only has one element too. That's that's what this says. M is this set in it. It's only one element. So all we have is one choice. There's one choice to rule them all, right? Um, there's one possibility. So the homomorphisms here, or sorry, the, 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 the functions are, there's only one. It just maps the only element here to the only element there. It's just, the function has no choice. Um, okay. Um, for the monoids, um, uh, here we're going to have monoids consisting of unary sequences of stars. That's, that's what this is. It's a unary sequence. The free monoid LS is unary sequences of stars. Mm. Um, and, and for those unary sequences, we actually are going to need to map them down in a way we're going to need to have a homomorphism between that and the and this uh, monoid M, which happens to have a single L possible element in it too. And what that means is the the unary, sorry, the the uh, empty sequence here, which serves uh, in this free monoid as the unit, needs to map to the unit here. Great, and then any combination of things here through concatenation needs to map to a to the corresponding monoidal product over here well it turns out that there's only one possible function which which does that i mean after all it maps the empty to the empty and it maps everything else to the empty too maps all the the, the val possible values from set of which there's only one to the to the I said if I said empty I said it should be to the unit here uh, the, the single single element so so there's only one okay let's go into something a little bit more interesting here suppose that um, we have here um, uh, s being zero and one okay and we have m being this kind of trivial monoid. Um, uh, and how many sequences are there from S to RM here? Well, um, here we're going to have zero one and RM is just going to extract this set from M from the monoid. That's what RM is. It, it's the underlying functor. It's a forgetful functor. It just it sucks out the the uh, the set here. And so what this is going to map is zero one onto a single element here. It's a singleton set. And there's no choice. You have to map zero to that single element. You have to map one to that single element. It's uh, there's no choice in the matter. Um, so there's all, again, only one possibility. Now for the monoid, now you're gonna have all sequences of zero and ones, but we're gonna need to consider homomorphisms of those sequences um, that map, map over to M. But again, we have basically zero, zero choice in the matter because M is only a single element uh, for, for our case. It is just a single element. So we're only gonna have one choice. Um, uh, and there's only one, one function which maps uh, any, old, any old element zero one or any old sequence to the, to the single thing. It can't go anywhere else. Okay, let's 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 take it a little bit more further, but still staying basic. So let's let's look at a case where S well, is a single element, but where M 
is actually this monoid, which has plus mod two. That's kind of interesting. And it has zero and one as its possibilities. Okay. Okay, so we have this being one thing. Now we, we hit it with the, the free functor. We hit it with the left functor, which is the free functor. And it maps to sequences of that single element. So these are unary sequences now. And those unary sequences now need to map down. They need to map down to the elements of they, they need to, to map into M. So so the so the empty one needs to map into some unit in M, which will be zero. Um be zero, because zero plus mod two something else is is that something else. Um and then every other every other uh thing here also has to we have to have a, a homomorphism. So any combination of things here has got to map over to the results of mapping over the, the pieces of that being combined and taking their combination here with plus. And if you, you think this through, this, this mapping G, which uh, let's consider this called G, uh, a homomorphism here, it can really uh, do one of two things. It can map everything to zero. Um, or it can map empty to, to zero and a single, single character to, to one. Um, and, uh, and basically it's going to be counting up uh, the length mod, mod two, because it's going to be, uh, it'll be combining those together to compute the, the length of the, the whole sequence um, if, we were, if we were seeking to do that. But basically, we have uh, two choices here. We can either map everything to zero or we can map empty to zero. That has to go to zero. And then a character, the, the, the characters that are in these sequence, these unary sequences to one. Um, and uh, that would be a homomorphism um, if, if we were to do that as well. Um, so uh, here uh, we can, End up um, uh, end up having in place two possibilities in both cases. Now let's consider zero one on both sides. Zero one here, zero one here. Um, so we have a monoid that has zero one as the possible things, and we have S as zero and one. Um, so uh, let's reason this through. Well, for set. Each, uh, we're just mapping zero one to zero one because we're mapping S, that's that zero one, to the, the set of items from the monitor, which is also zero and one. So uh, pretty straightforward. We can map zero to zero. We can map zero to one. We can map one to zero. We can map one to one. Um, we have basically four possible choices. Now for the monoid side of this, for the monoid side, it's a little bit more tricky with the um, uh, to think through. But basically, to have a monoid homomorphism here, um, we're going to consider the homomorphism G. We know that G of the empty sequence has to equal zero, um, and we know that G of A concat B has to be G of A plus mod two G of B. That that's just the mod mod two thing here. Um, so one way we can get this is if we map zero to zero. Well, okay, we have to map zero to, sorry, we have to map empty to zero, but we have some latitude now. We can map zeros. These are binary sequences. Since we have zero one here, these are binary sequences over here. So we could map zero to zero uh, in, the, in the monoid. Uh, and one to zero, in which case everything gets mapped to, to zero. That's maybe not so interesting as all homomorphism, but it's always a possibility and it preserves this property. Um, we could map zero to zero and one to one. And in a way you could think of this as related to counting ones mod two, but it's a consistent uh, homomorphism. Um, uh, we could map 
uh, zero to one and, and one to zero, um, or we can map zero to one and one to one. Um, so we have four possibilities. Um, each, each of zero and one can be mapped to each of these ones, which is four. And the same thing you know, carries, carries through. This should be uh, also uh, eight, two to the third such maps. Um, and in general, if you have some set X and some set Y, uh, by virtue of what you need to do to uh, offer, to adhere to the homomorphism property here, um, you have Y to the X possible monoid homomorphisms, and you have Y to the X uh, possible maps between the corresponding sets. Um, and uh, that gives us uh, this equivalence. So free monoids, um, you know, have this, this, uh, this isomorphism, which it, it, it on one hand seems outlandish, but if you really understand what it means to map a free monoid down to an arbitrary monoid, you can get some feel as to why it gives the same combinatorics as it does over here in set. Okay, um, now um, in my closing minutes here, though, I, I want to, the, the a key point here though is that, that I, I want you to carry away from this because we've covered a lot. Free monoids, uh, for a given set are sequences of elements drawn from that set where those sequences are of length zero and above. They're all possible sequences. And you could think of each sequence as sort of being a combination of the elements of X where we, we give each such combination a new name, but we capture associativity. So we, we, we don't, we don't willy-nilly create new sequences that only differ by where the parentheses are. We, we uh, were true to the, uh, uh, to the uh, uh, needing to, to achieve uh, associativity. So it's really distinct sequences uh, of values from, from X. And that's what is associated with a free monoid. I'd like to talk very briefly about um, two other constructs though that will be laying the groundwork for what's coming up and hopefully whet your appetite for why, while we will be nominally leaving monoids to discuss monads. In fact, monads will be there for, sorry, in fact, monoids will be there behind the scenes with monads and we'll make that connection explicit. But only that, we will further have um, monads um, or monoids uh, that we'll be revisiting for their applications with free applicatives and with uh, symmetric mineral categories and modeling type needs. But first I wanna introduce something called a bifunctor, okay? And a bifunctor will in some sense presage the, uh, the use of uh, uh, profunctors as well, um, uh, which are, 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 are sort of more interesting yet. But a bifunctor basically is a mapping, it's a functor but it's a mapping from a very particular category um, to another category. So we're gonna focus on bifunctors, which are from, uh, for a category C, which are from C cross C, which is a category where each object is the monoidal product of some object in C. Uh, it's, uh, sorry, it's just a, a pair of objects from, from C, any two objects from C and where the morphisms are pairs of morphisms um, uh, from corresponding objects in C. Um, and a bifunctor is gonna map that into C itself. Um, and uh, some, some definitions uh, are given uh, here, uh, but basically for morphisms, those morphisms are gonna go from the, 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 the corresponding products of their uh, pairs of their sources to pairs of their tar targets. Now, th the reason I want to introduce bifunctors is because they are key for the definition of a monoidal category. And you can 
uh, hear more about this um, at this um, lecture 15, where David Spivak gives a very nice introduction to them um, for programming with categories course. Um, we talk about um, monoidal categories um, uh, having a, uh, a, a, a being categories which have a monoidal structure. And it turns out there's there's different levels of strictness with which we can define this. This is defining a strict monoidal uh, category. Um, but here we're going to have this monoidal product, which is a functor, it's a bifunctor. And I should oh, probably say bifunctor, okay? Um, so this is gonna be, for a category to have a monoidal structure, there needs to be, it has to be equipped with or, or accompanied by a bifunctor, which takes pairs of objects in that category and maps it to a resulting object that um, is the result of their monoidal uh, combination. So it, it's combining objects to yield another object. That's a little bit different from what we saw earlier, but um, it also has to have a monoidal unit, which basically is an object in C. And we like to define that in category theory as a functor from the categories one object into C, which basically picks out exactly one object in C because uh, there's different functors that would from one to each possible object in, in C. And so this is a kind of fancy way of saying it's an object in C, but saying so in a, in a way that focuses on the, 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 uh, the relationships, the functors here. And it has to observe these properties. So um, this functor, um, which maps from C to C, from C cross C to, to C, from pairs of objects in C and to C and pairs of morphisms in C and to a morphism in C, um, has to observe uh, associativity and unitality. So it has to, if you combine with this special monoidal unit, any other object with this bifunctor, you get that other object back. Um, in whatever order, and you have to have this associativity. Um, now, uh, there's again, different levels of strictness for this, um, and, um, and they have to do with to what degree you have equivalence um, in these things, or to what degree you have, for example, natural transformations. And one of the things we'll be coming back to for, fleet, for applicatives are lax monoidal uh, categories and lax monoidal functors. Um, and it turns out that defining monoidal categories lets us define monoidal functors. Uh, oh, and then they have to observe some laws which basically impose, um, which, which basically are associated with these, these constraints. Uh, these have to commute. You have to be able to go around these in, in, in any order. And I won't go through them now. Now, this is a thing I wanted to get to though because monoidal categories provide us this rich language that's really useful in two very use, very important area of applications. Number one, by allowing us to reason graphically about models of a situation. And uh, this is from Brendan Fong's lecture, which I'd invite you to watch. Uh, here's the, uh, the link to this particular time. But basically he maps out this relationship, whoa, between some of the things we've been seeing, like pre-orders. We're gonna get to monoidal pre-orders. And in fact, there's a video for them if you wanna kind of be able to go on that side of it. We kind of went with monoids and categories and monoidal, uh, monoidal categories um, right here with monoidal categories. But basically once you get to this level, you can draw out these things called wiring diagrams and, um, and reason about them in a way that's completely mappable to, defined with an isomorphism to operations on a monoidal category. So you can write out uh, these, uh, these components um, as uh, in these monoidal operations. So for example, F here is going to be, uh, is going to be operating on the monoidal product of Y and Z, okay? Um, and uh, and uh, Z here will be operating on something that's X, monoidal product of X and, and B here. 
Uh, and it turns out that each of these other things like monoids can also be illustrated diagrammatically. Um, and with categories, it's kind of like that, except we have typed values, um, things that are, are not necessarily equivalent. Here we have anything can be put after everything, anything else, but that's not true for a category. And we'll see monodal pre-orders have some, uh, some illustrations associated with them uh, as well. Um, and uh, it turns out that this side of it, um, through monoidal pre-orders and monoidal post sets have these sort of uh, structure that can be illustrated where we um, are combining successive, uh, successive things. And this will involve um, uh, monoidal products uh, associated with, um, uh, with some of these uh, combinations like lemon, butter, and sugar here. Um, but uh, we'll also have an ordering that will obtain between the output from the input. And what this is saying is, as non-obvious as it sounds, uh, lemon tensor butter tensor sugar tensor yolk is less than or equal to lemon filling. Um, so you get lemon filling out of these uh, these things, um, and you 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 sort of extract lemon filling from this. It's greater than it. You produce it uh, from that. It, it has more things you want. So um, if you're interested in learning more about the diagrammatic representation, we're going to come back to it, but it probably won't be for a number of weeks until we've really tapped out at junctions, monads, et cetera. So if you're interested in going down this side of things, I'd refer you to these videos. And I'd refer you to, to these as well, which talk about um, um, some of the application of this in a modeling context. If you want to see something about how this uh, ramifies for functional programming, um, you can watch these videos on free applicatives um, and free monoidal functors. Um, uh, and uh, this programming with categories um, uh, lecture also uh, speaks about, about this, um, and uh, as does Bartosz's uh, presentation here. Um, so monoidal, um, uh, monoidal uh, pre-orders uh, will provide a point for growing our discussion of monoids, um, but free monoids provide this very nice illustration of adjunction and gives an illustration of the ways in which you can get these homomorphisms between very, two very non-obvious things. The next lecture, we're going to be looking at a different application of adjunction associated with monads. And monads are going to sometimes have very interesting functors associated with them. For example, a functor to pair things up or a functor to evaluate things. Um, but they're also going to have um, uh, some, some rich structure associated with the, the round trips and what are called uh, in the definition of adjunction eta and uh, associated with mu, um, mu for collapsing things down, uh, eta um, and epsilon. Um, so this could be co-unit and unit uh, with, uh, with eta corresponding to unit and epsilon corresponding to co-unit, which are the result of round trips here, um, uh, of, of sort of mapping over and mapping back. Um, and those are going to be associated with monads. Um, and every round trip will yield a monad uh, or a co-monad. Um, and uh, we'll, be, we'll be exploring that. And uh, it will come out that true to, the, to this lecture, um, uh, monads are associated with a, a monoidal category, uh, and the monoidal category will have a bifunctor associated with turning uh, a list of a list into a list, or a maybe of a maybe into a maybe, um, in a way that uh, is is observed in in functional programming by join. So, 
So we're going to come back to that, but this is a bit of a teaser. If anyone's interested in going into the, the modeling side, you're, you're welcome to, or the programming side more. Uh, that will be on our, our list, but uh, probably not for another some weeks. Okay, so uh, that's all we have time for today. I've taken you over time. Thank you very much for your attention. And hopefully this has reinforced some aspects of the basics of monoids as well as giving you a glimpse of this intriguing adjunction between sets and free monoids. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.